couple of things. We're going to get back into healing and the atonement. And we're going to, as I said before, move pretty quick. Um, one thing, too. I'm going to get these over here. Now, yes. First off, the, when it comes, because this question is about medication and people, when they're uh, ministered to, if they see a, a difference or don't see a dis- difference, should they continue in uh, taking their medication? Should they not continue? Now, this is a, a honestly, it's a personal thing between you and God and, you know, you, I, I can't even advise you on it, per se. Yes, sir. Ah, let me pull this closer. How's that? Better? That sounds a little bit better, and I'll move here. There we go. Um, when it comes to medication and things like that, it, that is, it's your wall, right? Now, I understand people getting, wanting to move forward, and that's fine. I'm not against that. That's good. And, but you also have to remember that I made steps along the way. Uh, some of the things I, I did, I wouldn't necessarily advise you to do. You know, some things I know I did just out of, well, I just, I just did them, okay? And God's grace, uh, it turned out good, okay? But um, if it affects you in a certain way, then, you know, the, the main thing is you're moving forward. It's progress, right? Constant progress. Don't let, uh, I mean, if you want to move forward, that's fine. If you want to, to grow, that's fine. But just don't put yourself or someone else in danger. For instance, uh, you know, if it's, you know, if you have uh, headaches and you take Advil or Tylenol or whatever else it is, you take it, you know, for the headaches, okay? If you quit taking it and you're going to believe God, okay, you're not going to drop dead, okay? On the other hand, if you're taking insulin for diabetes and you say, bless God, I'm going to quit taking my insulin, and you quit, you might want to start with headaches first, you understand what I mean? You know, because otherwise we may have to be, you know, I may get a call where I have to raise the dead. Okay? Because there are some things that you grow into. Now, I say that at the same time. When I, the first time we raised the dead, there was no way I was ready. But it was there, and it was my daughter. So I was going to stay no matter what. Right? So a lot of it just has to do with grit and staying. But what I'm trying to get across is that you taking medicine will not stop you from getting healed. Right? Medicine is not stronger than God. When, matter of fact, if, when you're prayed for, you're ministered to, if you're healed and you're still taking your medicine, the medicine, your body will react to the medicine. That's one way to know that you're healed. Is your body starts to react to the medicine. And then, you know, if you're going to a doctor or whatever, you can go to the doctor and the doctor will say, hey, you don't need anymore because healed is healed. Right? One of the things that um, I believe in pushing for the manifestation. You know, we've got too many people that's believing and been believing for healing for the last 20 years. Well, I'm standing for my healing. How long have you been standing? 15 years. That's too long. Right? We have to push on beyond this. Now, as I said earlier, there's two types of people. There's passive and then there's aggressive. The devil knows what type of person you are. If you are a passive person, generally, you will not be attacked with an instant fatality or, or fatal type of disease. Okay? You won't generally just drop dead. Usually, if you are passive, you will incur a long, slow, debilitating type thing that gradually eats away until you finally die. On the other hand, if you're an aggressive individual, you have an aggressive personality or temperament or whatever you want to call it, usually you don't get the Generally, now there's exceptions, obviously, in degrees, but generally you don't get the slow, debilitating diseases. You get the instant drop dead, no second chance. And there's a reason for that. The reason is, is that the devil knows if you're passive. And if you're passive, he knows that he can hit you with something that's long, slow, and debilitating, and you won't do anything about it. You'll take it. You'll put up with it because the devil loves to torment more than he likes to just outright kill. Because he feeds off of the pain. He feeds off of the hurt. He feeds off of the torment. But if you're an aggressive individual, he knows that if he doesn't take you out quick, you will mount a counterattack because you won't take it laying down. And so he tries to kill you quick and take you out with a stroke, a heart attack, or something, something that just kills you. Now, my job is to get you to become aggressive which takes you generally out of the category of the slow debilitating into the uh, instant and fatal type 
situations. Okay? So, aren't, aren't you glad? Okay? Yeah. But, but, the, <laughs> but the beauty of it is you don't have to put up with any of it. Amen? Amen? And if you get aggressive... Now, there is an area where you're going from passive to aggressive that... I don't, I'm not going to say it's a dangerous area, but the devil knows. And he just generally doesn't take it lying down. But at the same time, you can get past that point to where you are aggressive to the point where you start... He doesn't want around you. All right? And, and he starts to avoid you. We, we've had situations actually like that going recently. As a matter of fact, there was a man that was... Um, he was dying of cancer. They had already, he had already been given uh, three months to live, and then three months or four months later, he was still alive. But they said any minute, any day, they called in the family. A family called me, and I went from Dallas down to Waco. We drove down to pray for him. I drove down, went down by myself at that time, and ministered to him. And when I got there, I ministered to him and talked to the family. And he was, he well, he was incoherent at that point. And so I just talked to him a little bit, and I said, you know, because I. As I'm talking to him, I'm saying, now this is what you might see and some things taking place and, you know, a slight rise in body temperature. It won't be like a fever, but the body temperature may arise. That, that's just proof that we hit. That's not a bad thing. It's a good thing as long as it doesn't get too high. If it's too high, it's a fever. That's a bad thing. But we notice a change a lot of times like that within 24 to 48 hours. And I said, now, so if you notice anything unusual like that, just give me a call when you notice it. If we have to, we'll pray again. We'll hit it again. And the lady said, well, you know, it's strange you mentioned that because... He's had this cancer for like four years now, and not 15 minutes before you got here, we were talking about you coming, and all of a sudden he bolted forward and basically threw up this green gob of stuff that had never, they had never done that before. And I, I asked him, I asked the lady, I said, didn't know what to describe, because the nurse had, had been there at the same time, and he said, I said, now, describe this to me. And she goes, well, it's the first time it ever happened. It really surprised us. We were just, had just mentioned about you coming. And all of a sudden, he just bolted forward, still unconscious, never woke up, bolted forward, threw this thing out. The nurse changed the bed sheets, changed all the stuff, picked the stuff up. And I said, well, what would you do with it? They said, well, we flush it down the toilet. And I'm like, okay. And she goes, why? And I said, because. I said, I can tell you, it's over. It's done. He, he's going to be okay. And she said, well, why? What is that? And I said, when, when did it happen? She said, well, we had just finished saying you were coming. I said, that's how I know it's over. I said, because, now, it might try to come back later, but as of right now, he's healed. Why? Because we have developed a reputation. And basically, the thing left before we got there. You see? You, you can do that. Now, I knew the same thing with Dr. Summerall. When Dr. Summerall would go into foreign countries, when, he, when we landed... When he put his feet on the tarmac, a lot of times you have to walk from the plane up into the airport. When he put, I mean, there'd be a line of people coming down behind him. He was usually the first one off. And he forgot his Bible on the plane one time, right? And he told this guy that was with him, said, go back and get my Bible. And, and the guy didn't think anything about it, you know, because we were always doing different things for him if we needed to. And, but the guy handed the Bible and said, Dr. Merle, you know, because he didn't usually ask us to do things. We just saw it needed to be done and we'd do it. But he... This guy asked me, I said, why did you send me back? He said, you know, I didn't even know where your Bible was. You could have went and got it. And he goes, because I never back up. You hear that? See, that was, that was what was in him. Now, that may, you know, you may think that's a little drastic. Okay, but understand, that was just his attitude. And you had to kind of, he was the closest thing to a pattern in the, in the spirit realm that I have ever been around. Right? And so, whenever he got on the tarmac, when he put his foot on the ground... Every time, there'd be a line of people waiting to get off the plane. He'd just stop right at the bottom of the little ladder ramp thing. And he'd go, he'd just yell out, Devil, I'm here. <laughs> That's it. And when he did that, it was like heaven and earth came to attention. Now, so you say, well, what do you mean heaven and earth? Okay, when a child of God speaks, heaven hears and agrees. Hell hears and obeys. You get that? When a child of God speaks, heaven hears and agrees. Whatever you bind on earth, bound in heaven. Isn't it right? Hell hears and obeys. Whenever he would do that, it's like every spirit, everything, every, every spiritual being went on notice. It's like, just like if you were in the military 
and you're in a dorm or you're in somewhere and a, the highest ranking officer or a, a higher ranking officer entered the room. Automatically. The first thing, officer on deck. You hear this. Everybody goes to attention. Why? Because a higher ranking officer walked in. That's what happened when Lester Simrall set his foot on the ground. That's what happens when Christians walk into a room. If you know it. You understand? If you know it, because what you know starts to exude from you. And when you, you, cause when you meet people, when you shake hands, there is an immediate checking in the spirit realm. It's almost like you're being read. Your spirit's reading them, and their spirit's reading you. And what you're doing is you're trying to get into the pecking order. Where do they stand? Am I above them, below them, in the spiritual realm? Where am I at? And immediately there is a set to where you know immediately this person is more powerful spiritually than I am, or I am more powerful spiritually than, than they are. You, you automatically sense it. And when you walk into a room, you, once you begin to understand this uh, authority structure, when you walk into a room, you, will, you can sense it. Who there is powerful, who is not, who is, has a rank, who does not have a rank, your rank in that. Because see that when I come into an area, I'm here as a guest. Regardless of the rank I have in the kingdom of God, I'm here as a guest. So I do not overstep, even if my rank would be technically higher, I do not overstep that rank because I'm a guest. You understand? But yet, as a guest, if I operate under the auspices of that person that's in charge of that place, then I can use my authority to help them accomplish accomplish things that possibly they couldn't accomplish because they were of a lower rank, but I come in as a servant to help them, and I use my authority to accomplish what needs to be done. You understand that? So there's a ranking that takes place. And all you have to learn is how to promote, right? How to get promoted. It's not a matter of how to promote yourself. Because believe me, if that's... (laughs) We are really poor at that, right? We don't advertise. We don't do the fanfare. We just do the job, right? But if you learn what it takes to get promoted, you don't have to be flashy. You can be just straightforward and do the job, and you'll be promoted, right? It's the ox that gets the work done, right? It's not the, you know, the Arabian horse that prances and rears up and is beautiful. It's the ox that plods along every day systematically that gets the job done. Amen? So, all right, now. Okay. Next. Um, yeah, we've got to get this finished up here. We've got some things got to cover, or else I'm going to be here another week. <laughs> so, now, we got to go here. That's, that's what my, my wife asked me on the phone yesterday. She asked me some things about the city. What about this? What about that? And I, t- I told her the answer, and she goes, all right, tell them we'll move there. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> so, hold on. Wait a minute. <laughs> That might not be too good to the people that have moved from around the country to come where we are down there. I don't know if they're going to be ready to move that quick. So, when I notice on the page, yeah, go to page 27, point D at the top. It says, to say that God is using the sickness or disease to teach you something is to say that the sickness is the Holy Spirit or that the Holy Spirit is a spirit of infirmity. Because the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. And the Bible says that you have no need that any man teach you anything, but the anointing which you have received of him abides in you and teaches you all things. So everything you learn concerning the Spirit of God or the things of God, you learn by the Spirit of God. Now, the Spirit of God may work through a person, but you, uh, technically, you don't need me. Right? You don't need, because the knowledge that I have, the success we've gained, you could have the same knowledge, same success without me being here. If you studied and had the same, some of the same circumstances and maybe even the same desire I did at that point, you would come to the same conclusions. All right? Because the same spirit that has taught me will teach you. Without me. You understand? Now, me come, you say, then what are we doing here, sitting here three days listening to you? Well, because. I can give you in three days. See, what I'm giving you in three days, it has taken me 30 years to learn. Right? 30 years. I've been studying. I've been practicing. I've been doing this. So you're getting in three days what it's taken me 30 years to compile. 
So me coming, you don't need me, but it might take you 30 years to get to the point where you will be after three days. Right? So we're here to turbocharge you and jumpstart you so that you don't have to go through the same things I did for 30 years to finally figure out the same conclusions I came to. Amen? So that's the point. Now, but the Holy Spirit is the one that teaches. And the, everything you learn, you learn by the Holy Spirit. Everything you learn about, the, about God and about the Spirit of God, you learn by the Spirit of God. I'll prove that to you in just a minute from Scripture. But I want you to know this. That everything you've learned has been by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. Therefore, if you say, God is using this thing to teach me, you have just relegated the Holy Spirit to the level of that disease. You understand that? So when you say, now, understand how close you are to blasphemy. Because that is exactly, now think, principle. In principle, that is exactly what the Pharisees did with Jesus. Nicodemus, which was one of the Pharisees, came to Jesus and said, We, the Pharisees, know that you are sent from God, right? That you're a a teacher sent from God because no man can do the things that you do except God be with him. And then what Nicodemus told him? But yet the Pharisees, now that was privately because Nicodemus came at night. But publicly, what the Pharisees were saying is, this man cast out devils by Beelzebub. But, and that's why Jesus said, your sin remains, basically, because you know better. And yet you're saying this to keep your position. Isn't that right? So what were they saying? They were saying that what God, that they were attributing to the devil the works of God. Now, what are you doing when you say that God is using sickness to teach you? You are attributing to God the works of the devil. Now, isn't that, in principle, the exact same thing? I mean, it's it's reversed, but in principle, it's the same thing. So, from this day forth, never say that God is sent this to you or gave you this to teach you or anything else. Because let me tell you this. It is amazing to me. How the will of God changes for people based on medical breakthrough. Because what is the will of God today? As soon as they find a cure, all of a sudden it's the will of God that it be gone. So don't try to use your sickness or disease to cover by putting the blame on God. Well, God is using this. God will use anything to teach anything to anybody in the sense that hopefully you will learn something from it. But people say, well, you know, God had to get me flat on my back from that heart attack before I would look to him and slow down. And well, Okay, now, if that's true, then anybody that goes to hell, it's God's fault because he didn't get them flat on their back and get their attention. Isn't that right? Because if it's God, he is no respecter of persons. If he did it for one, he better do it for another or else he is a respecter of persons. So when you start using these, see, every, you know what all these do? Every one of these statements are used to take the responsibility off of ourselves and put the blame on God. Every time. Every doctrine of devils, every tradition, every sacred cow goes back to that basic thing. Take the responsibility off of me and put it back on God. Every one of them. And so that's what I'm here to do is to get you to stop doing that, stand up, quit acting like a victim, and start becoming the victor. And get on God's side and start agreeing with Him and know that He He has set this thing up for you to win. Right? He has set this thing up. It, you do not bring glory to God by losing at any time. Now, you bring glory to God on how you act through hardship, good times, sickness, disease, all that. Yeah, you can bring glory to God by standing up and giving God glory while you're sick. Yeah. But that does not mean that it was God's will for you to be sick. Right? That's you turning a bad situation into a good thing. And yet people say, well, that's God turning things around for the good. No. That's not that. That's you doing that. Right? Now, God is grateful for the fact that, that you will give him glory no matter what. But regardless, don't put the blame on God for your lack of participating in the benefits. Because he told you, forget not all his benefits. 
Isn't that right? Don't you forget it. God ain't going to forget it, but don't you forget His benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. That's God's benefits. Amen? So don't be putting, don't put to God the works of the devil. Okay? All right. If you can tell, I get kind of riled up with this stuff. It's like I told people, you know, the old man's dead, but please don't say that to me within arm's reach. Right? He may come alive again. You never know. So, yeah. Next, down, it says healing, uh, a little bit down here. Healing is again connected to the atonement in scriptures concerning the Lord's Supper or communion. This will again prove the two together. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he was given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Note, Jesus broke bread first, just as he was scourged, whipped, before he was crucified. Isn't that right? He takes the bread and breaks the bread, then he takes the cup, Watch the next part. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament. That word testament should have been translated covenant. It's the same word. This is the new covenant in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread. Now what do we do first? We eat the bread first. Then we drink the cup. Now aren't you thankful? I mean, can you imagine drinking the cup and then eating the cracker? You'd sit through the whole service hacking up cracker the whole time. Cause, you know, right? You have the juice to wash down the cracker, right? And that way you can sing and everything afterwards. So, see, God knew what He was doing. All right? He knew. Now, He says here, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till He come. Note that the two are once again found and bound together. He says, Wherefore, whosoever. You notice that word, whosoever. Whosoever is God's favorite word. Right? Always, whosoever. Whosoever will. Salvation, healing, deliverance, you name it, whosoever. I like what Till Osborne says. Whosoever means yousoever. Right? That'll stick with you. Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily, eats and drinks damnation, and that word there is condemnation in the Greek, to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Notice it does not say, not discerning the Lord's blood. Now, let's go back. Throughout history, we have taught, people have taught, in the church, that when he says to examine yourself, because you're not discerning the body, that it is referring to you having ought against somebody in the body. You have a sin, you have something, and some offense or something, unforgiveness, something against somebody else in the church. And so before, it's kind of right. Take a moment, examine yourself, make sure you don't have anything against anybody, you know, in the church. Okay, I got news for you. You're not supposed to have anything against anybody anywhere. Not just in the church, right? This is not talking about, when it talks about his body here, he is not talking about the church. All right? I know that's what we've been taught, but it is not accurate. Through this, Paul was referring to Jesus. Jesus was not referring to the church. When was the church broken for you? Was it? The church has never been broken for you. Isn't that right? His body was broken for you. And that's what he says. This is my body which is broken for you. When was his body broken for you? Not on the cross. On the whipping post. Isn't that right? He poured out his blood on the cross. But his body was broken. By his stripes you're healed. So when his body was broken for you, that's the cracker. Right? Or the bread or whatever else you want to use. Right? His body. It is not talking about the body of Christ, the church. He is referring to his physical body. I will prove it right now. He says, notice, he that eats and drinks unworthily. What does that mean? Not discerning the body of Christ. And if you do that, you drink condemnation or damnation to yourself, not discerning the Lord's body. Why? For this cause, verse 30. Why? Because you're not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now, he is not talking about spiritual weakness. 
He's not talking about spiritual sickness. He's not talking about spiritual sleeping. He is saying, because you don't understand that his body was broken for you, that by his stripes you're healed, because of that, in your congregation, you're going to have people that are weak physically, sick physically, and die prematurely because they're not partaking of all the benefits that were provided by the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, to prove this, let's look at the church. If what they're saying is true, that you have to discern the church and not have aught against anybody, and we do that every time we partake in the communion, then we should not see weakness, sickness, or premature death in the church. And right, if we're doing if that's what this means, and we're doing it according to what they tell us, then we shouldn't see that in the church. But what do you see in the church? Weak, sick, and people that are dying early. Matter of fact, it's as much in the church, for the most part, as it is in the world. Maybe a slight difference. But the slight difference is due to the fact that in the church we're supposed to have less stress because we have a way to pray and it relieves stress. Medically speaking, they've proven that. All right? But overall, do you know of a church congregation where, any, where there's not one person in there that's weak, sick, or dying prematurely? There's not one church congregation in the United States, in the world possibly, that I know of offhand like that at this point. So the fact that this is going on, this proves that what we've been taught about, how that verse refers to forgiveness. Now remember, forgiveness of sin comes through the blood. And they right? So if he was going to talk about forgiveness of sin, he would have said, you don't discern the Lord's blood. Right? But he didn't say that. Why? Because what? We know he forgives. We have no problem with that, with that he forgives, right? Our problem is, does he heal? Which is kind of funny. It's what we were talking about earlier. The, the Jews were exactly the opposite. They had no problem believing that Jesus could heal. But when he forgave sin, boy, that was a problem there. So what do we do? We have turned it exactly the opposite. Isn't that right? Now, yeah. let's move on. He says, for if you would judge yourselves... If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Note that many among you in the church are weak, sickly, and some even sleep in the Lord, because they did not discern the Lord's body, not the Lord's blood, but His body. If one can become sick by partaking communion wrongly, then naturally one can obtain healing by partaking correctly. Amen? Now, let me give you a real quick story, uh, testimony. We were in Kilmarnock, Virginia. A little church way out. I mean, way out. There was no cell phone service, no internet, nothing. All right? I mean, we were cut off from the world out there. <clears throat> Actually, I have to give you two testimonies on this, both very quickly. One is, I just taught all this. And the pastor, a good friend of ours, said, why don't you stay over and teach? Tomorrow is Communion Sunday. Why don't you just do Communion and teach this? And we'll just have Communion. We'll do it this way. I said, okay, we'll do it. So we stayed over and we had the church service. We were doing Communion. We went through the whole thing. I explained the breaking of the body and what it was for, and I, we passed all the elements out. And everybody had us. All right, take this bread, hold it in your hand. They, they had, um, I think they had the, like the matzo crackers. Actually, is what they were using. And they took the cracker and they passed it around us. All right, take that cracker, hold it up. Now say this with me. Say, by His stripes I am healed. His body broken for me, and by His body being broken for me by His stripes I am healed. I receive my healing now in Jesus' name. And I said, now, take that cracker and put it in your mouth. And they put it in their mouth. And, you know, communion service is pretty quiet, right? Quiet, kind of solemn. And it's so funny because it's real quiet. And, I mean, out of nowhere, right over on this side from where I was facing, right over here, like second aisle back on the pews, all of a sudden, you know, you're quiet. You're kind of analyzing yourself, all that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden, this woman screams, this blood-curdling scream, which in the middle of a communion service is pretty unnerving. Right? And you're kind of like, stop, you know. And you're, you're thinking for a second, all right, you know, it's a devil manifesting. And we're going to have to cast this thing out, right? And this woman has been over and she is screaming. But yet, at the same time, she's screaming, but it's muffled. And she's like, I can't talk. I can't, and, and she can't even talk. And this woman had a goiter that you could put your hand around on her throat. You know what a goiter, you know, it's right there. And you could put your hand around it, literally. And. She was bent over and just gasping, and I can't breathe, I can't breathe, something's choking me. Something's... And, you know, now everybody's gathering around her, and we're like, okay, we're going to have to cast the devil out. And, you know, and we stand there for just a second, getting ready to do something, and all of a sudden she... And when she raises up, the goiter's gone. Right? And then she said, Jesus. She saw Jesus take her goiter and squeeze it. And when he squeezed it, 
it disappeared. But it was as she said, by his strength. It was the first time she had ever participated in communion correctly. Now, after that, we're all looking. Everybody's, yeah. All right. I went back, got the cup, and I said, now this is his blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Now, drink it. And you already seen it, but now everybody's like, I mean, they were doing everything, right? Because all of a sudden now it's real, okay? It's in just some cracker and juice. I mean, this is like, (laughs) you know, yeah. It's a serious business now. Real blood of Jesus. You know? And we're not talking about, you know, we're not talking about, what is it, transmutation or whatever it is, that transubstantiation, where, um, you know, the blood becomes, I mean, the juice becomes the actual blood. And, okay, now, first off, that cannot be true. The, the cracker and the juice cannot become the physical body and the flesh and blood of Jesus. It cannot. Why? Because if you take those crackers even after they have been blessed by a priest or anybody else, and you leave them out on a table, you know what will happen? They'll get moldy. You know what that's called? Corruption. You know what the Bible says about the body of Jesus? It says, He will not leave his soul in hell or leave it in the grave, and his body, he will not suffer to see his body suffer corruption. So if that was true to the body of Christ, it should stay perfect the rest throughout history. right? So that cracker does not become the body of Christ. You understand? It is a symbol of what he went through and the breaking of his flesh. Okay? So, in order to solve that. So, if you go somewhere and they do that, then you can... See, we're killing sacred cows. So when you go back somewhere and you hear one of these sacred cows preached, then you can kind of be back in the crowd where nobody can see it, and you can just kind of sit back there and go, (laughs) Okay? And that'll let everybody know that that's a sacred cow. All right? That has become the JGLM... Signal right there. Okay, you'll know who else in there is from and has been trained through J.J. Lim because it'll be the the, the cattle call or whatever it is. Okay? <laughs> so I tell people we kill all these sacred cows because I'm from Texas and we know barbecue down there. All right, we 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 know how to kill them. So now, page 28. We're doing pretty good on time here, I guess. So page 28, Isaiah 53. Now this will prove. Are you are you pretty convinced so far that healing is in the atonement? Right? Okay, now. Isaiah 53. Now, this is a whole chapter I have laid out for you. And I'm not going to read the whole chapter. You can read it right here. But does everybody agree that Isaiah 53 is referring to the suffering Messiah, Jesus, when he came? Right? And this is the uh, when Jesus said that it might be fulfilled, that which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He was referring back to Isaiah 53. Right? Because he quoted out of that verse, out of that chapter. But let's go to first, verse 4. Surely he hath borne, and you'll see a word right after that, which is the word nasa. It's a Hebrew word, and it says, and that's the actual Hebrew for the word born there. Surely he has borne nasa, our griefs, and carried sabal, that's the Hebrew word, our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. Now remember what I said when I quoted uh, Matthew eight sixteen and 17, because it says there he took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. This is the verse he was quoting. So when it says he has borne our griefs, it means he has borne our, our uh, infirmities okay, and carried our sicknesses. That word sorrows means sickness and disease. So we could even say that way. Surely he has borne nasa, our infirmities, and carried sabal, our sicknesses. All right? Now, verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now, go down to verse 11. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear, Sabal, their iniquities. Verse 12. Therefore, because he's going to bear their iniquities, will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he has poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare, Nassau, the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now look at verse 11 and 12, the uh, bold words there. Bear, Sabal, in verse 11, and bear, Nassau. Notice the word is translated bear both times, but using different Hebrew words, Right? And you'll notice both times in verse 11 and 12, it is referring to him bearing our iniquities and our sins. Right? 
Now, did he bear our iniquities and sins? Yes. Now, the word Nasa and Sabal, if you look them up in a dictionary, they mean this. To bear as a punishment for another so that the other does not have to bear them for themselves. That's literally what it means. So, we know that he bore Nasa and Sabal, our iniquities and our sins for us, so that we don't have to bear them. Isn't that right? He bore it as a punishment, so that we don't have to bear it. Right? Now, that's what Nasa and Sabal means. Now, the amazing thing is, we believe that when it comes to iniquities and sins. But if you go back up to verse 4 and 5, it's the same words used. Nasa and Sabal, which means to bear as a punishment for another so that the other doesn't have to bear it. Right? So, the same words are used, according to Matthew 8, 16 and 17, for sickness and infirmities that are used for our sins and iniquities. So, whatever he did for our iniquities and sins, he did the exact same thing for our sicknesses and our infirmities. Isn't that correct? Same word used, he did the exact same thing. So if he bore as a punishment our iniquities and our sins so that we don't have to, then he also bore as a punishment our sicknesses and our infirmities so we don't have to. Isn't that right? Now, here's the dilemma that you are now on. You must decide to either accept the fact that he bore our sicknesses with the same result that he did our sins, or you have to decide that he did not bear your sins. Because whatever he did for one, he did for both. And you cannot choose one without the other. You either have to accept that he did the same thing for our sicknesses that he did our sins, or you have to accept the fact that he did not bear our sins. If you think he didn't bear our sicknesses, then you must, according to Scripture, agree that he did not bear our sins. So, which is it going to be? Are you going to believe that he bore your sicknesses the same way he did your sins? Now, how hard is it to get get rid of your sins? Pretty easy, huh? Isn't that right? He said, if you sin, what do you do? We have an advocate with the Father. That if we confess our sin to him, what does he do? He is righteous and just and faithful to forgive us, isn't that right? And to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. It's just that easy to be healed. Amen. Because he bore the same, the same way. Isn't that right? They were both done at the same time, te- I mean, within the time of his crucifixion. One was done first. The healing was taken care of first, and then the sins. Amen? Is that pretty clear? Is healing in the atonement? Is there any way that it's not in the atonement? I've shown you like four or five different scriptures here where they all go together to say the same thing. So, any, and, and this is what uh, T.J. McCrossan also said in his book. For any person to claim that healing, physical healing, is not included in the atonement, he is either not a scholar or he is a liar. One of the two. Now, I don't know anybody here that claims to be a scholar. I don't. I don't know any of you that do. So the only other option we could be is liars. Isn't it right? And we're not going to be liars. We're going to agree with the Word of God. We're going to say what it says. And we're going to agree with it and do it. Amen? Amen. So, did he bear your sicknesses? As a punishment so that you don't have to. So that means that if sickness or disease is upon you, you're both bearing it. He bore it and you bore it. And you're bearing it now. Isn't it right? Now that is a travesty of justice. For two people... To be convicted and served for the same crime is technically, it's almost like what we call double jeopardy when you, whenever you get accused of the same thing twice, right? It is a travesty of justice that you should carry something that someone else has already paid for. Isn't it right? But as long as you have a crooked lawyer, you may just bear it. But when you decide to pick up the advocate that the Father has given you, then you don't have to bear that anymore. He will tell you. Now, think about this. When, remember we went to the court system at the beginning? And I said, we're going to go before a judge, and the judge is going to determine a case. And you have a, 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 a um, prosecuting attorney, and you have a defending attorney. Isn't that right? An advocate. A defense attorney is what we would call him. Now, the defense attorney stands up and says, this is why my client should not be punished. 
Isn't that right? Now, your defense attorney has a pretty good argument. Because he stands before the judge, who happens to be his father. So already the court is stacked in our favor. Isn't that right? He stands before the judge, who is his father, and says, Father, this person should not bear the punishment of this sickness because I bore it. Isn't that right? And therefore, if I bore it, and I took the punishment of their sins and their sicknesses, then obviously this person cannot be held guilty and accountable because I have put that to my account. So if anybody's going to be punished, it has to be me. And then what Jesus is saying? And what is the Father going to say? Well, since you've already bore the punishment, what's he going to tell the defendant? You're free to go. And they're right? Set the captive free. Amen. Right? It, now, think about this. If healing is in the atonement, if it's provided for by the stripes of Jesus, is there any qualification? Is there any reason to look for why that person shouldn't be set free? Okay. Is there any, is there any way possible that the prosecuting attorney can have any argument? Yeah, but you don't understand what they've done. Uh, Father, excuse me, I object. I carried that. Isn't that right? Yeah, but you don't understand. They let me in. Uh, excuse me, Father, I, I object. Um, I bore that. that. That sin was accounted to me when I hung on the cross. Overruled. Isn't that simple? See, in the, in the court of heaven, God has decreed freedom for all mankind. There is nobody that you can set free that God has not first set free in heaven. You understand what I'm saying? God has already decreed their freedom. And now your job is to go and agree and say, yes, he has decreed freedom for all the oppressed. That's why he told that woman, when he called her to him, bowed over. He said, woman? He didn't say, do you want to be? He didn't say, woman, does the devil, is the devil going to allow it? He says, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. No questioning, no faith, nothing. Just a decree of a policeman from heaven. Decreeing the freedom and saying, devil, back off. Get off of her back, literally. Amen? And she was instantly made whole. Isn't that right? Is that pretty simple? All right. We, ooh, I got ten minutes. Hang on, hang on, I got ten minutes. We're going to do in ten minutes. Let me see. Yeah, actually, let me give you uh, one more thing because we, we're going to break just before lunch. Go to Luke chapter 17 real quick. Luke 17. <clears throat> Been telling you to set people free. Now I'm going to give you some responsibility too. Luke 17. Starting, well, we could start anywhere, but let's just go ahead and go on down to verse 5. And the apostle said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. Now, we talked about this the other day, but I'm going to take it a little bit further this time. And the Lord said, If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. But which of you? Now, notice this. It sounds almost like he changes topics, but he's not. Okay? The disciples were concerned about faith. Lord, increase our faith. Right? He says now, it sounds like he's switching, but he's not. But he's not talking about faith. But notice what he does talk about. So faith is the underlying aspect. But don't try to turn what he's talking to into faith. Just realize how faith acts. Okay? Verse 7. But which of you, having a servant, plowing, feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by when he comes from the field, Go, sit down to meat. Now, and let me give it to you in English. He said, which of you? You're, you're the master, and you've got a servant. And the servant, you say, hey, come in from the field. Now, come on in, whenever the servant comes in. Now, here, sit down, let me feed you. He says, the master doesn't say that. When the servant comes in, he's finished a hard day's work. The master doesn't say, oh, here, let, sit down, let me take care of you. He says this, and will not rather say unto this servant, make ready wherewith I may set. In other words, you've been working, you finished that work, i got another job for you. Right? Now, sit down. And he says, now, now let me sit down and you're going to feed me. And he says, Where, whereby, wherewith I may sup. And gird yourself and serve me until I have eaten and drunken, and afterward you will eat and drink. In other words, even though you've done that job, you come in, you still have another job to do. When you finish this job, then you can eat. Right? After you've taken care of all what I need. 
And people see, most Americans look at that and go, well, that ain't right. But it's because you don't understand servant and master. Okay? Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? And he says, I trow not. That means, I don't think so. Right? In other words, he said, he didn't bring him in and say, well, you've worked good. You've, you've done that. Now, he says, he doesn't thank that servant just because he's done these things. Watch what he says. So, likewise, you. Now, this is a command. Likewise, you. When you shall have done all those things which are commanded you. Notice the word commanded. When you've done those things which are commanded you, say. This is a commandment. He's giving them a commandment right now. When you've done everything you've been told to do, say this. We are unprofitable servants. You would think, you're an unprofitable servant? You just told me I've done everything that I've been commanded to do, and now when I do everything I'm commanded, you're telling me to say I'm unprofitable? Now, if you know the Bible very well, you know that any reference Jesus ever made to an unprofitable servant wasn't a good reference. Isn't that right? The unprofitable servant is the one who gets cast out and beat with many stripes. Isn't that right? So here he's saying, when you do everything you're commanded, then you are to say, I'm an unprofitable servant. Why? Because we have done that which was our duty to do. In other words, we've only done what we were commanded. So, what is the definition of an unprofitable servant? Only doing a person who only does what they are commanded to do. Right now, let me ask you this. Let's look at the church today. What does the church say? Lord, I'll do whatever you tell me. Lord, if you'll tell me, if you'll lead me, if you'll give me a word, Lord, if you'll quicken it to me, I'll do it. In other words, you give me a command and I'll go do it. Well, even if you just do everything you're commanded, you are commanded to say you're an unprofitable servant. So even if you wait and get a word from God every day the rest of your life and then you go do that word, even after you've done all that, you are still an unprofitable servant. Why? Because you had to be commanded. So what is, if, that's a, if an unprofitable servant is a person who does all they're commanded, what would be a profitable servant? Somebody that does what they're not told to do. Somebody that does what needs to be done and not what they're commanded to do. Now let's take it back into, into natural. I had background in uh, restaurant management. And it was amazing because I would come in. And it's funny, I'd, you know, sometimes I, didn't always, I wasn't always the first one there. Usually I was. But many times I wasn't the first one there. And when I would come in and I wasn't the first one, whenever, because they, they watch for you. If you're the manager, they watch. And when they see your car pull up, everybody gets busy. Right? And the ones that aren't paying attention, when you open the door and they see you, it's amazing. They'll be standing there holding the broom, talking. Yeah, and there's you. I mean, all of a sudden. You know, right? I mean, they get busy. When you open the door, you hear this rush of movement. Right? Where everybody gets busy. You know, what I used to do, because I was the, the restaurant training coordinator, I was in charge of training people to be good employees. And one of the things that I used to do is, when I would get there first, I would take a little bit of trash, pieces of paper, not, not messy trash, but just pieces of paper, water it up, throw it on the floor, between the door and the door that leads behind the counter. And then I would just stand back and watch as people come in. And you, you could watch them. Most of them come right on through, go right on in there, punch their card, and... Get back there and do stuff. But what I was watching for, I'd watch. And as they come in, and the one that walked past and see that trash, they'd big reach over and pick it up, take it and throw it in the trash can, and then they'd go punch in. Right? Those were the ones that I started looking to promote. Why? Because they didn't do just what I told them. You see? They were cleaning it. They weren't even punched in. They weren't even on the clock yet. But they cared enough to take initiative to actually do something on their way. Right? And what did that tell me? That told me that I wouldn't have to watch them all the time. And that means that if they are that conscientious, then they will also impart that to anybody they're over. So I would make them shift leaders. Because I knew I could leave the restaurant with them and it be taken care of. But the ones you had to tell everything... What to, give you another illustration. Monday mornings after the weekend, usually the weekends are the busy times. Monday mornings you have to make all your, your truck orders and all that kind of stuff. If you want food by Wednesday... You've got to make your truck orders on Monday. If you don't, you're out of food by Wednesday and Friday and you're in trouble. So I, Monday morning, I'd be in there making the orders. I'd be in there figuring out. I'd have all the, the receipts from the weekend and be figuring all this stuff up and adding it up and trying to figure it out. And I you know, usually shut the door because you don't want a bunch of money laid out there and 
door open. And about that time, this new guy, man, you can tell he's new because when you walk in, he's got the uniform shirt that's still creased where he took it out of the package in the back and put it on. And he's standing there looking all stiff. And so I go in, and as I walk through, he says, Morning, Mr. Blake, how you doing? How you doing? I don't even know his name because it's really not even use, any use of me to learn his name because he's probably going to be gone within 10 days anyway, right, because it's a high turnover rate. So once they've been there a month, then you try to learn their name, okay, because they might stay a little while. But I go right on past him. He's standing there. I go in there. I shut the door. A few minutes later, he comes up. You hear this. I'm not going to open the door because I don't know who it is. So I say, yes, what is it? Uh, Mr. Blake, just want to know uh, if there's anything you want me to do. Okay, now I have to shift my attention, right, from all the figures, numbers, making the orders, all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, okay, uh, what can he do? He's new. He uh, check the dining room. Yes, sir. He's gone. Two minutes, man, I'm back here figuring this stuff out. Two minutes later. Mr. Blake, yeah, what is it? Uh, got the dining room, sir. It's okay. Um, what do you want me to do next? Okay. Shift thought, right? Uh, trash cans. Did you check the trash cans? Ah, good idea, sir. He's gone again. Five minutes later, right back. Okay, now my tone is changing. Um, yes, what is it? Okay, that's kind of like saying, leave me alone, right? Uh, sir, got the trash cans. Just want to know if there's anything else. Have you... All right, see, I cut him off in minutes. Have you checked the parking lot? No, sir. Well, wait. Before you do, check our parking lot. Matter of fact, punch out before you do. Check our parking lot and check every parking lot on your way home because I don't need you. Why? You're making minimum wage. I'm making three or four times that. But now you are costing the company your wage and my wage because I have to tell you everything to do. Are you a profitable servant? No. You're an unprofitable servant. Unprofitable servants don't last. The servant that stays busy and finds things to do, right? You've been trained by the company. You know the company's mission. You know where we're headed. You know what our goal is. See, if I'm a good manager, I will fire him, right? Because my job is to make the company profitable. He is not profitable. So my job is to find somebody who is profitable, who I don't have to tell everything to do. So the profitable profitable person, employee, is the one who looks for things to do in keeping with the company's overall objective, which is to grow, expand, make profits, help people, do good for the employees and for the people we serve. Amen? Why doesn't the church get that? Why does the church think that the... You come into Christianity, and the height of Christianity, when you get in, you want to tell everybody. You want to witness to everybody. You want to pray for everybody. You're telling, because the grass is greener, the sky is bluer, it's wonderful. You want to tell everybody how saved you are. Isn't that right? But then, you get around Christians. And they look at you down their nose. Bless God, sooner or later you'll calm down and be just like me. God forbid. You know, you'll, you'll die and be dead just like I am. You know? But when you first come in, you're excited, you're on fire, you want to witness to people. And for some reason, you don't even think about being led. All you're thinking about is tell everybody, help everybody. This is wonderful. I've got to share the news. Isn't that right? And yet, for some reason, we think that as the further we go along, we start going the other direction. We think that the height of spirituality is to be told everything to do, when to do it, how to do it, second by second. Isn't that right? Now, turn that over into the, into the natural world. If you have a child that's two years old, and you have, you have to tie their shoes every five minutes, and it right? I mean, constantly. You tie it. I don't know how they do it. You can tie it in a double knot. They'll come back in five minutes. It'll be undone. And they're right. It's amazing. They get it undone, right? And they'll come back over, and their shoe will be untied. And they're like, they put their foot out. Why? For you to tie their shoe. You tie it again. They're off. They come right back. Now, that's fine. You, no problem, right? They're young. You don't mind tying their shoe because they don't know any better. Now, when they turn 22... If they walk over and go, here, tie my shoe, right? We have a problem. Isn't that right? Why? Because the older you get, the less supervision you should have to have. What's that called? Maturity. Why do we think it's the opposite in the church? That we think that the older we get in Christ, the more supervision we have to have. The more detailed we have to get. The more detailed instruction we have to get. Why do we think that? You're, here you are, if you've got kids, you get, maybe your kid is 12, between 12 and 15 years old. For the last 10 years, you've been going to, taking them to school. You come up in the afternoon on trash day. The trash can is out there. You've taken it out in the morning or they've taken it out. But every time you come back, the trash can is empty, upside down, halfway down the street, wherever it's at, right? 
and you get out of the car. For the last 10 years, you have to tell that child every time, bring in the trash can, right? They bring it in. Then one day, you get out of the car, child gets out of the car, trash can's laying over there, you turn to tell the child, go get the trash can, and he's already headed down there. He gets a trash can, turns around, you're standing there, your mouth is open, you're standing there gawking at him, he looks at you like, what, what? And you go in the house, you're stunned, right? He takes the trash can into the garage, or wherever you put it, he goes in, you, you go in, what do you tell your wife? Glory to God, salvation has come to this house. <laughs> Isn't that right? He's, you look at him and you go, little Billy's growing up. Now think about that. Okay, so the, the rite of passage, which proves you're growing up, is pulling in a trash can? No. It's a fact that you didn't have to tell him. And they're right. Why? Why does that mean maturity? Because it means he took responsibility. He knew it needed to be done, and you didn't have to tell him. And they're right. That's maturity. That's maturity in Christ. Whenever he doesn't have to tell you. See that person over there? They're sick. Go pray for them. Well, I will when you tell me. He's told you. You're waiting on a phone call. You already got a letter. See, that's maturity. When you don't have to have that distinct, clear leading every time. See, because if he tells you everything to do, then when you get done, having done all you've been commanded to do, then you're an unprofitable servant. But if you're going to be profitable, you're going to look and find what needs to be done in keeping with the parameters of the kingdom of God. And when you do that, you're growing up. Amen? And when you do that, religious people will get extremely mad. Because they're going to start thinking you're, you, that you think you're something. And they're going to say, who do you think you are? You know, you, who, who, who died and made you king? Jesus. This answer. All right? Simple as that. You know, well, who do you think you are that, that you, you think you're holier than thou? No. We don't think that we're holier than, than thou. Maybe more obedient than thou. But we're not holier than thou, okay? All right? Are you getting anything out of this? All right, well, let's go. If we're going to do an offering, let's do it quick. Get you all out of here, and we've got to get done. So, all right, when we come back, we've got a lot of ground to cover. Okay? We're supposed to break at 5. I don't know. We'll see. No, we'll get it done. We do, but um, I, I like the way these are going. They're, they're coming out real good. And uh, I'm not having to, uh, how can I say, break through a lot of things.